Yeah, so this was a really interesting study that uh, basically corroborates what, what we've known about the intravesical gemcitabine releasing system uh, for some time, uh, dating back to the preclinical studies that really led to the development of this product. So um, these are uh, 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 pig studies, uh, and the uh, idea was to see whether there's uh, tissue penetration for a more prolonged period of time. So there were five pigs, three uh, who underwent intravesical uh, gemcitabine uh, treatment, uh, so to speak, and uh, two pigs that underwent uh, the TAR-200 insertion. And then the pigs were sacrificed at uh, uh, various time points to see what the tissue penetration was in the wall of the of the bladder with the with the two uh, intravesical solution uh, versus the TAR-200 um, uh, sustained release. And as, as expected, the uh, and what we're measuring is the gemcitabine uh, metabolites. Um, and as, as expected, uh, the metabolites uh, are actually making it into the lamina propria and to some degree, actually the muscularis propria uh, with the intravesical installation. Um, but that effect goes away within 24 hours. Um, as expected, this is a solution that's put in there and, and, and uh, uh, later... Um, uh, evacuated. Whereas that with the TAR two hundred device, you saw sustained um, uh, release of the uh, active metabolites uh, twenty four forty eight up to ninety six hours uh, after, and that was the sort of end of study. Uh, it wasn't looked at before, and you you still have high concentrations of these active metabolites. Uh, again, sort of proof uh, behind the uh, principle that uh, this is uh, actually eluding active drug uh, for a period of time that's actively penetrating the deeper layers of the bladder. Again, not just the mucosal layer, uh, but the lamina propria as well as the muscularis propria with sustained uh, um, a delivery of this uh, medicine, at least for 96 hours. Now, you know, you can look at further studies and, and see uh, how much um, you could do longer studies. Uh, previous studies have looked at uh, the systemic absorption, and that's very low as expected and as hoped. Uh, so we've already looked at the systemic absorption, uh, and this was really a tissue penetration study. Uh, so really uh, interesting. I think there's there's more to be done there to sort of go back back to the science of uh, how this is working and how it's different than the uh, intravesical installation. Yeah, so for uh, in terms of uh, let me uh, tackle the first part of the question, um, the uh, sustained delivery and this notion, this concept that the drug is in constant uh, um, uh, contact with not just, again, the mucosa, but the submucosal layers and, and to some degree, the muscularis layer uh, for prolonged periods of time is probably what's responsible for the much higher clinical complete response rates that we're seeing. Uh, when compared to the intravesical uh, installations of only one hour. Um, you know, in the past, most of the drugs that we put in the bladder have, have that effect. This is a cytotoxic drug. Uh, so the more contact we have with the tumor in place, uh, the more cell death uh, you're going to expect. And so um, this is sort of, again, going backwards and looking at the mechanism uh, of which um, uh, this this is uh, uh, making it... Uh, uh, um, uh, how it's working within the bladder. Um, so we expect that we're, we'll see more of these types of studies and uh, some other interesting studies that you may think of is, you know, how far does it go? Uh, they only looked at the muscle, you know, does it actually penetrate into the perivesical tissue? Is there microcirculation uh, that you, you can see actual delivery of the medicine into the, into the lymph nodes? These, of course, have implications on the uh, breadth of patients for whom uh, you would be expecting this to, to work. Uh, in our uh, preclinical, in our phase one study uh, done many years ago, uh, it was a neoadjuvant approach, and, and we, we did see some complete responses. And of course, in Sunrise 4, uh, you can see some CR, uh, substantial CR rates with the TAR-200 device um, uh, uh, place in there. Of course, uh, you know, those patients are getting citrolimab as well. So, uh, you know, we, we can't separate out the effect of the PD-1 inhibitor versus the TAR-200. But um, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited about uh, this uh, result and also what's to come now from this.
Yeah, so um, it certainly gives us um, a, a little bit more comfort to know that uh, this is not just um, uh, treating the superficial um, layers of the bladder where there's contact with actual potential tumor cells, uh, such as CIS, but that's actually penetrating the deeper layers. So it has implications on treatment of high-grade T1 disease, for instance. Um, I don't think just based on the small study, we can make any uh, claims on uh, treatment for muscle invasive disease, but there was a study looking at that as well, and a and, and number of patients who had these prolonged clinical responses for a long time. So again, it kind of explains that. But it does, again, give us comfort because for most of the intravesical cytotoxic agents that we've looked at in the past or have been studied, uh, the effects are really on that sort of surface layer and patients with high grade T1 disease generally don't do well. Now, clinically, we, we don't have, we haven't separated out too much of those patients with high grade TA or CIS versus T1 and the response rates. That's to come. Uh, the Sunrise One study will shed uh, a lot of light into you know, the um, differential uh, responses in those uh, subtypes. But at least for now, um, this is a very preliminary study looking at you know the, the depths of uh, the tissue penetration and what we expect and what we hope. Yeah, I mean, certainly, um, I, I think, you know, Change8 has done a, a tremendous job in covering a broad spectrum of disease states um, in which the TAR-200 may be uh, helpful. Um, and it's really good to see because uh, within the trials, we even have additional cohorts uh, to look at. So uh, everything spanning from BCG naive patients all the way to muscle invasive disease in the Sunrise 2 trial uh, for instance, to see uh, what is the efficacy in, in patients with uh, uh, T2 disease. Um, that, that trial was uh, stopped due to futility against, uh, um, against chemotherapy, but we'll have data and we'll see how many of those patients were actual responders. And in the future, hope to use those results um, as a potential option for these patients who are not candidates for uh, trimodality therapy. Uh, just because it was not superior to it or there was a futility analysis doesn't mean that it didn't work. I, I myself have several patients on the trial right now um, who've had, uh, who with muscle invasive disease, who are uh, long term uh, responders over a year uh, with the TAR 200 citrullamab combination therapy. So uh, I think, you know, as we, uh, obtain more and more data as it, more data comes in from the from all the trials, uh, from Sunrise 1 to uh, the newly opened Sunrise 5 trial, uh, we're going to really see where this works best. Um, and with it, I hope to see this correlative science that's, that's already planned and already in, uh, taking place uh, from urine studies to, to studies like this, to the animal studies to show the uh, depth of penetration. And I hope to see studies in the future looking at, again, the perivesical microcirculation, um, act, whether the active metabolites actually make it to the perivesical tissue, to the lymph nodes. Um, we know they're not present systemically, so we're not claiming that this is a systemic res you know, response, but, but is there a response to the microcirculation? Could this uh, potentially have some effect on, on uh, the uh, you know, perivesical lymph nodes, for instance? So hopefully those uh, you know, studies will be uh, planned in the future.